delivering the news dealers count on for 10 years. Subscribe today and join thousands of other automotive professionals. CBT News, 10 years strong. Hi, it's Steve Greenfield from Automotive Ventures, and we're back for the latest episode of The Future of Automotive on CBT News. Welcome to the show, and I'm glad you could join us. This week, we have a special guest joining us here on the show. Back almost exactly a year ago, RunBuggy, a technology platform that connects car shippers and transporters, announced that an investor group comprised of the Larry H. Miller Company, Porsche Ventures, and Hearst Ventures committed to a Series A financing to fuel the company's growth. RunBuggy launched in 2018 with a mission to simplify car shipping. Since then, the company has built one of the world's largest digitally enabled carrier networks and transformed automotive transportation logistics management for thousands of shippers and haulers. On today's show, we welcome RunBuggy CEO Kevin Malik to the show. Kevin, it's great to see you, and congratulations on the acceleration within the business. Thanks for having me this morning. Excited to be here and excited to chat with you for a few minutes. Great, great. So let's start off with your perspective on the industry. Start at a high level. Things seem to be evolving very quickly this year. What are you seeing from your perspective? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a pretty interesting question. I think, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot going on right now. I, you know, we see some increase in inventory. We see a, quite a bit of change on the consumer retailing side. But in short, you know, with inventory coming up and, you know, interest rates going up, we're seeing a little bit more on the lots filling up, lease returns, uh, more movement. But at the same time, with some of the EVs coming online, such as Lucid and VinFast and Rivian, we're seeing more and more direct deliveries, right? More customers buying directly, delivering to their homes. So you see this kind of change in, in patterns that's probably not normal from the last couple of years, but maybe going a little bit back to pre-pandemic. I think by the end of the year, you'll see inventory right rates rise, but it's going to be different by each, uh, each OEM. Okay, that's a great perspective. Um, let's focus in a little bit more on startups specifically. Uh, there's been a lot of change, obviously, like in the, this last week even with startups. What's your perspective on the automotive uh, space and startup scene and what's needed to support it? Yeah, I think we're at an inflection point, Steve. Um, think, about, think about the rate of change and let's not even focus on EV or ICE, but let's talk about it is changing right? There's OTA, there's different types of, you know, I'll call it fuel sources, whether it's EV, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's hybrid, all that's software driven, right? And that's just at the, at the actual physical vehicle side. To manage subscriptions, to manage online buying, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be bridging the skills gap, right? You've had kind of a relatively stable environment for probably 15, 20 years, right? You had mechanical improvements, you had had changes at the dealership, but now everything is just in time, over the air, different pieces of technology, education. Startups need to be around to power all those, mm -hmm. right? You, you have a hard time as a large organization building some of those features fast enough internally. This is why you see, I think, so much activity in automotive startups, right? It even comes down into our space in logistics where it is, like I mentioned prior, how do you move the one car? How do you move the one EV to a consumer? That is becoming a real challenge. There's some talk about, hey, it's the weight's too, too much or things like that, but that's just fewer spots on a truck, but it's more about getting the vehicle to the person a timely resource. So at the end of the day, I think across all segments of automotive, there's gonna be a huge skills challenge, which is perfect for startups. That's great, great, great opportunity. So let's rewind the clock about a year. Um, you know, in my intro, I mentioned that you had a significant capital raise last year. What was that process yeah. like? You know, that process is, is, is I think, always uh, a bunch of uh, highs and a bunch of lows. It's an exciting uh, process. It can be a little bit time consuming, right? One of the things I learned in the past is like, um, I don't want the company or even myself to think about our jobs as raising capital. Of course it's necessary, right? Of course we need to do it. And, you know, it is, it's one thing to find money. And this is what I kind of talk to my team about. It, you have to find the right kind of money. What do I mean by that, right? You have to, who's gonna sit on your board? How are they gonna be impactful to you? Are they gonna be veterans of the industry? Are they gonna be understanding a go-to-market strategy? Can you talk to them? Can you call them when you have a, a, 
a difficult problem, right? The last couple, not a couple of weeks, the last few days were pretty interesting in the startup land, right? Or our board was fantastic. And so that is a, a, a key lesson, I think, for all, for all CEOs running startups or people wanting to get money is like, don't just go get anyone. Don't always just chase the valuation. Chase who's going to help you to grow, right? Who has good insight into your industry? Who has good insight into how to scale? Scaling is tough, right? There's a reason it's very hard that they, that phrase exists. Going from five people to 150 is not easy. Right, right. So it's always good to talk to you, Kevin, because you know you're relatively new to automotive. But pre-automotive, yeah. before uh, joining Runbuggy, you had a very intriguing background. Would you mind sharing with everybody a little bit about what you were doing before Runbuggy, and then maybe provide a bit of perspective around how you view your role as sort of an investor and or versus an operator? Good question. See, I'm, I am new to automotive. I'm a huge, huge car guy. It's one of the reasons I wanted to kind of get involved in this. But you know, m most of my career, you know, the last 25 years have been involved around technology. And you know, used to call it back in the day IT, right? But now, you know, really involving into building systems, building things for scale, um, change management, coordinating with vendors, looking at things like cloud computing and data center technology, right? I've spent a lot of time in that space, and you know, I think I've had the luxury and the opportunity, and I say that knowing that you know, sometimes you have to be in the right place at the right time, but to raise money in the past and to work with other leaders and other founders and understand what was wrong, what was right, make mistakes. And it's led me to this point at Rumbuggy. And, you know, today I, 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 I think I resonate well with some of the investment community and our board because I know what it's like to be sitting as a, an investor or an LP, but I also know what it's like to be an operator. And you brought up something, Steve, that's incredibly important to me and my senior team is as we look for additional partners and we look for additional things, it's almost like what operational experience do you have, right? That is so key. I don't, you know, we can all talk about unit economics and we all talk about measurement of LTV, but understanding what it's like to be an operator in difficult times, mm -hmm. right? The joke we have at Rumbuggy was, you know, we were born right before COVID had a global pandemic shut down. Then we had the greatest inventory reduction known in automotive history. And now we have banking issues across the board, right? What is that? How do you run a company through that? It's easy to sit back as an investor and say, well, just run leaner, right? That's, that's, that's not a lot of value in it, right? right? It's like, how do you continue to grow and, and, and accelerate your footprint? And so those are the kinds of things I think I've been able to bring to the table, but I also look for advisors in our company, right? To, to help us with that. That's great, that's great. So um, let's zoom out now. So um, getting your perspective on mobility more generally, um, you know, there's a lot of changes going on, as you mentioned. Is call, car culture dead? Is it changing? Or are we simply consuming transportation in a different way? That's a great question. I think sometimes people tend to think, oh, no one's driving a manual anymore. Car culture is dead, right? Oh, we, we're, no one's you know, working on the cars on the weekend. It's dead. I don't think any of that's true. I think it's never been more robust. I think you read reports about kids not wanting to get their license, not getting to drive. But at the same time, <clears throat> go to any car show, go to any customization shop, go to any grand opening, go to any EV store, they're packed, right? And what's happening is, I think what you just said, we're just consuming in a different way. We're looking at how to get into the car at the time we want to get into it. We're looking at what's important to us. Is it power? Is it efficiency? Is it family? There's more information online than there's ever been. I think it's just spread out a little bit different. To me, you know, working with some of our accounts, right? Like we work with Bring a Trailer, it, it's never been busier, right? And it's not just about the high end exotics. You have entire groups of kids and younger people looking at, you know, cars that they can restore and build. You have people modifying EVs and Tesla. It's to me, I, I'm, I think it's a fantastic time. I think we relish the change. You have thousand horsepower ICE, you have thousand horsepower EV. <laughs> what more could you ask for? I think that's why you see nothing staying on the lot. 
No, I think you're right. I mean, we, we we'll look back in 20 years. We're living through the golden age of vehicles right now, for sure. I hope we can right. continue. The, the cars are just insane that are coming out, and we're all benefiting from that. So, um, so let's talk about your business. You know, we hear a lot in the press about this tension around the shortage of truck drivers. Are, are you really feeling there's a shortage of truck drivers out there? I, I don't. I don't think so at all. Right. I think you might have spot challenges, right, where there's something that is, you know, um, something that's caused a surge or a depletion of drivers, one, a surge of volume or depletion of drivers. But what I, what I do think is, as an industry, we can do a much better job of optimizing, right? Mm -hmm. The analogy I use is, you know, every time we all fly, you know, no one flies as much as you, Steve, but, <laughs> you know, the planes are full. They are. They come back full. Yep. They sometimes oversell. I could probably go out today, you could probably go out today, Steve, and see open trucks, spots open, driving back empty, waiting at a lot, right? Running out their logbook. There's there's tens of thousands of fantastic drivers out there. These guys work hard day in and day out. It's our job to keep their trucks full, keep their backhaul full, optimize um, their time as well, right? I don't think there's any shortage of drivers. I think we, we got used to, I think we're hearing more about it now. We have probably some people leave the industry, but we got used to, hey, there's 50 cars, 500 cars at a lot, and and people would show up. When you have to have two or three, and you pick up two or three 20 miles from you, mm -hmm. there tends to be like, oh, there's not enough drivers because it takes time. What we have to do as an industry, we have to put software on top of this. We have to optimize it. We have to look at how to position their routes, their their drive time and help them also from a drop-off perspective. Which cars come off first, which go on first? It's really, really key. So I think I think there's um, I think there's enough drivers for the volume that we have today with respect to automotive hauling. That's great. So let's bring it home here, M most relevantly here. What what can we expect to hear about Run Buggy in the near future? Uh, we're just getting started, Steve. I mean, I think you know one of the most exciting things that I think I can share without going into too much detail and getting in trouble with the board that I speak fondly of is, um, you know, we're going international, right? I think by the by the end of this year, you'll see us in three more countries with uh -huh. our software. Um, we already have potential partners lined up. Um, couldn't be more excited, right? We've spent the last, you know, three and a half years building out an incredibly scalable platform, right? My A lot of my senior team has come with me from the past. Some of them are from automotive. We've taken everything that we've learned in both verticals and put it into this piece of software. And now we're seeing adoption from the biggest names, uh, not only in North America, but we have some fantastic interest in, in multiple countries. I think the other thing you'll, you'll start us to see is um, continue to ex ex scale our operations, right? We really believe that having the ability, like I was just talking about, to optimize and drive ESG functions and drive decarbonization in terms of keeping trucks full is mission critical, right? We'll announce a couple of big OEM partnerships as well based on that fact alone. Very cool, very cool. All right, so I'm gonna circle back to something you said earlier, you're a self-professed car guy. So I'm gonna ask you this, hopefully this isn't too much of a curveball, but tell me about the one that got away, either a car you owned in the past that you wish you'd held onto, or a car that you had an opportunity to buy, but you didn't, and now really regret that decision. Yeah, I, I, I know this one right off the top of my head. I don't even have to think about it. Um, you know, the circumstances where I was thinking about a $500 difference between ASK and my price, 993 C4S Arena oh. Red Porsche 911, right? Nice. But I was, in my head, you know, it was 97. I think I was looking at it in mid 2000s. It was like a $500 difference. And if, if anyone's in the car space, you know how much those cars are worth <laughs> right. today, yeah. right? And it was not even about the value, Steve. It's about this is, this was what I like, the sound, the interior, the color, you know, that's when they really got the, 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 the shape, you know, it's just perfect car. And now I look at it and I go to, you know, some of the online auctions, I'm like, well, now it's worth three times, right? Right, right. Outpaced any stock investment, any kind of other investment you can make. Yeah. So, Would you have driven money. it? Would you have driven it or just parked it? I, I drive. Okay. I, I, I drive a little bit too much, you know, one of the things to add to that is, you know, when we do sometimes team events, sometimes companies do golfing and stuff, we go to the racetrack. That's great. 
Love to hear that. Love to hear that. Well, Kevin, you've been very gracious. Thank you for making time for us today. I know you're a busy guy. Congratulations on the progress in the business and uh, really appreciate you being here with us. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for your time and thanks for uh, having me this morning. Well, thanks for making time for us today, Kevin, and congratulations on the progress in the business. So with that, let's transition to our companies to watch. Every week we highlight interesting companies in the automotive technology space to keep an eye on. If you read my monthly industry intel report, which you can subscribe to for free, I showcase a few companies each month, and we take the opportunity here on this segment to share some of those companies each week with you. Today we have two companies to watch, Icon Technologies and Rejuel Energy. Our first company to watch this week is Icon Technologies. Icon Technologies strives to be the trusted partner of franchise dealers by providing reliable, user-friendly, connected telematics applications and services to help you save time, make money, and build lasting relationships with your customers. The reason that I love Icon Technologies is that the company was founded by car dealers who help you instantly locate your inventory, easily monitor battery life, identify the location of stolen inventory, and provide consumers with service reminders and notifications. You can check out Icon Technologies at www.icontechnologies.com. Our second company to watch this week is Rejuel Energy. Rejuel's mission is to maximize the value of every battery. The company recognized how a lack of battery health information could lead to huge waste across the ecosystem, particularly at a battery's end of life. Their goal is to enable repurposing, which extends batteries' useful lives and allows them to store energy again and again. The reason that I love Rejuel is that with the accelerating rate of EV adoption, it's important that we start planning now for how we're going to reuse, repurpose, and recycle used EV batteries at their end of life. Rejuel is positioned to play an important role in the circular economy of used EV batteries. You can check out Rejuel Energy at www.rejuelenergy.com. So that's it for this week's Future of Automotive segment. If you're an auto tech entrepreneur working on a solution that helps car dealerships, we want to hear from you. We are actively investing out of our new dealer fund. If you're a dealer who wants to invest in early stage auto tech companies that benefit your business, let me know. We are still accepting new investors into the dealer fund, but we'll be conducting the final close of the fund by the end of April. If you're interested in joining our investment club to make direct investments into auto tech and mobility startups with small checks, please join the club. There is no obligation to start seeing our deal flow and we continue to have attractive investment deals available to our members. And don't forget to check out my book, The Future of Automotive Retail, which is available now on amazon.com. Thank you for tuning in to CBT News for this week's Future of Automotive segment and we'll see you next week. For a limited time, $1 gets you full access to all the automotive industry news and content CBTNews.com has to offer. CBT News. Subscribe today.